This is going to be a story in three parts. It's called The Druze, The Muslim, and The Jews. And uh, we'll throw in a few Christians to make it interesting. It's a story in three parts because it's really too big a story to tell in one session. So I want to begin with the story of the Druze. The Druze are a very specific group within the Middle East. They prefer to be called the Muwahideen. And originally beginning in Egypt, they broke away from the Muslim religion and mixed together some Greek philosophy, some Hinduism, and uh, they tend, although they recognize Moses and Jesus and Muhammad and so on, they tend to uh, link themselves most with Jethro, Moses' father-in-law. They think that he was an ancestor of theirs. And in fact, they have a shrine to him up near the Galilee at the Horns of Hattin. They're about a million strong. Although they began in Egypt, the majority of them today are in Syria and Libya and northern Israel. There are some, I think about 50,000 in the U.S., they don't believe in proselytizing. You can't become a Druze, a follower of their religion. They have this mixture of reincarnation, and they think that, well, originally you had a chance at the time when the religion was founded, and you've been recycled several times, and sorry if you didn't pick it the first time around, you're not going to get in now. There are very few celebrations, very few holy days, a liturgy, and so on, they're divided into two groups, essentially the ignorant and the educated, not really so much in their educational background, but in their religious background. There's a, perhaps a 5% of those who study their ancient scriptures and so on. Well, interestingly enough, of course, Syria's constantly had trouble through a very long period of time. And Sudan opened their doors to Syrians fleeing their own country. It was the only country in the world where Syrians could go without a visa. And this particular man, who features in our story, first name Nofal, last name Binay, he went to Sudan. Uh, he was an uneducated man, and he really wanted to learn to read. Didn't have a lot of money found an old dusty book, which was a big book, and thought, well, by the time I finish reading this, I should be able to read well. It was a, an Arabic Bible. As he began to read this book, he was fascinated. He just became so enamored with the story of the Bible. And with help from a, a Christian who shared with him the gospel, this dear man put his trust in Christ. Now, he had an unfortunate marriage situation, married someone he thought was a Christian who, in fact, was not a Christian in name only. It made a very difficult life for him, but he had a large family, many children, and the testimony is that they are all going on with the Lord today. He lived eventually, moved back to the region and settled outside of the city of Haifa. There's, a, I think, one of the largest Arab villages in the land of Israel, Kafar, which is the word for a village, Kafar Yasif. Some people think named after Joseph, actually probably after Josephus. And it's northwest of Acre, or Akko, just north of Haifa Harbor. Akko, or Acre, was in the Bible times called Ptolemaeus. And there was a small assembly there, and Paul visited there one evening and shared the word of God with them. Anyway, through the years, uh, there has been Christian work in this region, and an assembly of believers was started there in Kafar Yasif. And that's where this dear man lived. He worked in Haifa, worked at the large refinery there, had a fairly low-level job, and while working, had a terrible fall, surprisingly was not killed, and was given a large amount of money, which he gave to his wife, and uh, she 
spent it on things that were not maybe very helpful for the family. In any case, he in his spare time would begin to walk through the hills of Galilee, visiting villages and sharing the gospel. He would sing wherever he went, and people treated him like he was mad. They would throw rocks at him. They would shout at him, send him away. However, there was a weak spot in their defenses. The Arabs have this compulsion to show hospitality, even to their enemies. You come to their door, they feel obligated to take you in. And so he would show up at their doors and they would feel obligated to invite him in. But they wanted to show him at the same time that they were not happy having him there. And so very often they would give him the burned bits of the bread or they would give him the dry bits or even some that was past due, shouldn't have been eaten. And he would happily scoff it off and share the wonderful news of the Savior. This dear man led many people to the Lord. Uh, as he traveled through the uh, hill country of the Galilee. And uh, only eternity will tell the results of the ministry of this dear brother. He worked with J.W. Clapham, who uh, was a school teacher from New Zealand, who came to the land of Palestine as it was then. And after the British had been given responsibility to oversee it, this dear brother, J.W. Clapham, had a tremendous ministry, traveling from place to place just with a tent and very basic equipment, uh, cooking his own meals, sharing the gospel, was able to see local churches established in many, many cities in the Middle East, not only in the land of Palestine as it was, but in Nicosia, Cyprus, and Istanbul, Turkey, and down in Egypt, and in Syria, and Lebanon, and Jordan. Uh, did an extensive work in the area, and this was one of his co-workers as they labored together for the Lord. And so it brings me to this wonderful verse, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. Now, this does not mean that if we are people of position or people of influence, people with skills, people who are respected in the community, that we can't be used by the Lord. One of this dear man's own sons became a medical doctor. But here was a man, really unlettered, uh, hardly able to read, uh, reading the scriptures, discovering Christ, and then sharing the gospel. And the whole objective of our lives should be to move towards nothing so that Christ may be everything. This is contradictory to the ways of the world, to not to seek our own glory, to not to seek our advancement, our recognition, but to see that God gets all the glory. So whether high or low, educated or uneducated, it's our privilege as Christians to say with a great company on high, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name. May the glory be.